My daughter was on there. She did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't fumble the bag. Good job, baby. Now, I'm excited you guys are here. My name is Adrian. I have the honor of being the founding pastor here at Engage, and we want to welcome you again to our Christmas service a little bit earlier. Um, we are in this thing talking on the land of misfits. When actually Jesus came, he lived as a misfit. Those who follow him lived as misfits, those who didn't fit in. And when Jesus came, there were some things he brought this Advent season. They were, there was the expectation of him coming to bring some things. And so as we go through this, we're really unpacking what does it really mean to live as a misfit, to live differently. The scriptures tell us that those who are followers of Jesus, that we are kind of as aliens and strangers in this world, that we shouldn't fit in, that we are part of this world, but we should live differently. And that is our hope and that is our goal, that what we can come out of this over the next several weeks is actually looking at what does it take for us for those who claim to be followers of Jesus to live as that as misfits. So that being said, I want to pray for us as we dive in. So Father, we thank you so much for today. We say, come Holy Spirit, reveal God the Father, reveal Jesus the Son. Father, we just thank you so much for all that you are going to do in this moment. It is in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. The title of my sermon is a little bit strange today, but it is called The Tale. It is called The Tale, all right? You got it? We're good? All right, here we go. It is called The Tale of the Alligator the samurai, and the patient. The tale of the alligator, the samurai, and the patient. It'll make sense in a moment. So when I was a kid, um, I was, uh, one day I was out playing. I was playing with some friends, and, and as I was playing with my friends, all of a sudden, I run across, I don't know if it was like if it was a two-by-four or something. Somehow, we were just playing, and I run across this piece of wood. As I run across this piece of wood, I get a splinter in my finger, right, right here. But it wasn't one of those splinters that's like right at the top. Right? It's one of those ones that all of a sudden that thing hit and it's like, oh, it just decided to go to the deepest part of your, you know, like of your being. And so it's deep inside my skin. So I come in, you know, getting a tough, you know, eight year old I was and like I'm crying. And I'm like, mom! And you know, whatever, whatever. And so she goes and she like pulls out some of it. But she's like, baby, it's really deep. We've got to like go a little bit deeper to get it out. Now, I don't know if you grew up like this, but in a black home, I saw this happen before. So what this meant was this. That my parents reverted back to 1814 <laughs> and put a needle on the stove and would heat it up. Like we're on the Oregon Trail and we ain't got modern medicine. So my father, who now all of a sudden becomes a doctor, Ebenezer Benedict, decides to like, you know, let's go. And I'm like, no, like, whoa, no, no, no shot. About to dig in my hand. Like, what? So. I'm like, I'm like fighting. No, no, you're not doing it. So they're like, fine. They're like, okay, fine. But they're like, Adrian, your hand's going to get infected. So in that moment, I had relief from the, the original part being out. But I'm like, I don't care. It ain't a problem right now. So it stays in. So I'm just going throughout my day. I, coming up. I keep going throughout my day. So as the thing keeps, so as I keep going throughout my day, here's what starts to happen next. Next thing you know, I'm like, my finger starts to get just swelling more. So, but I'm trying to deal with it. You know, I play basketball, I'm trying to, I'm going to catch the ball. Like, I mean, I have to like re learn how to catch it because I can't catch right on that finger. If it hits, it's like, oh. So I'm doing it. I'm walking around the house like it don't bother me. But when I'm in my room, I mean, it's like aching, right? This goes on for a couple weeks, right? This is like going on for a little bit. No, it's true. It's going on for a couple weeks to a point where, guys, I'm not, like, it was like out here, right? Like it, uh, so finally, my father said to me, he's like, Adrian either you're going to let me do this or I'm going to have to take you to the hospital. He's like, because it's getting to a point to where like, I mean, it was, it was causing chaos in my life. Like it was causing chaos. I mean, like you couldn't, you know, you, 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 you start realizing the things you like miss when you have injury, right? So I couldn't pick up certain things, whatever. So all of a sudden I'm like, so I'm like fighting it. No, no, no. He's like, Adrian, either you're going to have to let me do this. I'm going to have to cut into it or we have to go to the hospital. So it's your choice. It's your choice what you want to do. And he's my dad says, like, but you got to trust me. I'm not trying to hurt you on purpose, but we got to get this out. And so for whatever reason, I let Dr. Ebenezer go and put a needle on a freaking thing and cut open my hand. And, and let's just say I just, you know, was super tough. No, not at all. Screaming, hollering. <laughs> as like, I feel like every bit of infection just oozes out of my hand. It was disgusting, right? But here's the thing, though. After it, boy, that little bit of pain, 
Boy, my finger, I was back to catching the ball. Yeah, I felt like a whole different man again, right? Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with alligator samurai, anything, Christmas, Jesus, all that? has a lot to do with it, I promise you. Here's the deal. See, as I was thinking about this, I began to think about this idea of where, like, I actually believe in our current moment that we're in, there's really an infection that human beings had. Just as my finger was infected, I believe human beings, many times in culture, things get infected that causes chaos for us. See, when my father pierced my finger, peace came to me. See, I believe in the world today, what is starting to happen is that there is a thing. There is, we are in chaos. I'm like, I mean, I think we all can like experience this. It's seeming like there's just more chaos than it's ever been. We, you as human beings, as you're sitting in here, there's chaos you feel. There's a lot more chaos than you actually feel any point of peace in your life. We wonder what's going to happen, like, with the, like what happens with the economy. We, we, we we're wondering what's going to happen with global, with war and things like that. We're wondering, man, like with inflation and the rise of inflation, and now all of a sudden what you used to could get for a certain amount of money, now all of a sudden your cereal boxes are smaller than what they once were. It drives me crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, Fruity Pebbles, though, I used to get the big box, right? Now they're shrinking the box down, and it's the same cost. They're a little bit higher. I'm like, I don't understand this. How do I get smaller? And it costs more money. That causes chaos in me. <laughs> but even more, like, as a pastor and, and even just working in different worlds, even the consulting company working in corporate world, I can't tell you, a lot of work I end up doing, I end up pastoring people because of the level of chaos that actually is existing inside of everyone. When I talk to people who are working, they are, they're working harder than they've ever worked before, but still making less money. And all of a sudden, now they're all over the place. And then at home, they still got problems. Listen, inflation is up, but that doesn't stop the fact that our kids are still growing up and their issues and all our personal issues and our, and our family of origin stuff and all that stuff is still going. And it's creating chaos. And there's more and more chaos. And people are just going. And here's the thing. But what we do is that we don't ever stop to realize why is there so much chaos at times? in my own life, why is there chaos at times in our world? There's chaos, but yet and still, even you're in this room and you are a follower of Jesus, if you're in here and you believe in this finished work and you're even wondering, well, yeah, he said he's this prince of peace, but I don't actually feel peace. Like, I'm just being honest with you. There's so many moments I'm walking around life that I stop, like, do I actually feel peace? And see, here's what I've come to realize, that what's really happened in our world is that, and what's happened throughout human history Chaos has ensued is when human beings forget the order. Say this again. Chaos ensues in any place when human beings forget the order. I have been reading a lot by a guy by the name of Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor was this, he's a Canadian philosopher, wrote books in the 90s that were actually incredibly, incredibly profound and prophetic about the future of the world. Charles Taylor, again, has this book called The Age of Authenticity. Here's a quote that he says. Modern freedom was won by our breaking loose from older moral horizons. People used to see themselves as part of a larger order. In some cases, this is a cosmic order, a great chain of being, in which humans figured in their proper place along with angels, heavenly bodies, and our fellow earthly creatures. This hierarchical order in the universe was reflected in the hierarchies of human society. Now, he uses a lot of words there, but here's ultimately what he says is that in this modern world, here's the thing, that human beings, now again, and, and you know this about this church, we talk about the idea of authenticity and human beings being self-aware and resilience, remaining self-aware, finding purpose, calling. We believe that and engage. You're going to hear a lot more about that in a minute. But like we really believe in this. But here's what's happened in that, is that at times when we go chase this idea of self, we throw off every boundaries. And what Charles Taylor is saying, that in the modern self, to go chase whatever we want to be and whatever we seem that we can do, and we can just go and we take all the boundaries off that we actually took boundaries that we forgot we were part of a great chain of being. And when this happened, chaos ensues. Chaos ensues when individuals realize that they don't have, they think they don't have limits. If you don't believe me, here's the thing. Samuel Bateman freed. If you don't know, maybe you've heard SBF over the last few weeks. FTX, cryptocurrency. A man who at one point in time was worth $33 billion and with one overnight, he has $100,000 in his bank account. People have lost millions of dollars because of what seems to be a Ponzi scheme. And what seems to be a man who had this altruism of that, I'm going to be this person who's going to give all to the world, but yet and still deep inside, he was actually doing for stuff. When human beings forget that they have limits, human beings create chaos. If you don't believe me, that's what we're watching, the unraveling. Whatever your thoughts is of Elon Musk is simply this. He is a man who really pushes the limits. 
He inspires me at times with the limits he pushed, but sometimes you realize human beings are just human beings. Steve Jobs was what Scott Galloway called, he was our modern day in people's eyes, Jesus Christ. Here's why, because Steve Jobs, what? Man, I got my phone up here, but he gave us that beautiful thing called the iPhone. And technology is like magic. It can create and connect us and do things. And here's the thing, and we started looking for these Christ-like figures around. We think it's politicians, that if we get this person in office or this person, they're these Christ-like figures. But here's what we have to understand. Human beings always fail us. But yet and still, we put our trust in human beings. That human beings are going to take us to some utopian world. And when human beings forget that they are just mere man, chaos ensues. What they would do during the time of when, in, in Rome, when Romans would go and they would, and they would win wars and battles and they would have a ticker tape parade coming back. They would hire a slave and the slave would just stand there. He would drive the chariot and he had one, he had two jobs, drive the chariot and every now and then whisper in the ear of the emperor, you were, you were only but a man. So as he's riding and chariot, he would whisper into the ear of the emperor, you were only but a man. And it was to remind the emperor that human beings have limits. Many of you right now, I want you to understand you are chasing at times outside of your limits. And it creates chaos. But yet and still, he's supposed to be this prince of peace. When we forget the order that human beings and where they fit in the global order or really in the hierarchical order of things, that there is God and then there is man. When we think we have limits beyond God or we try to play God, chaos ensues. So how does this bring down practically? And then we're going to get into the story today. At times as parents in this room, we go outside of our limits to play God in our kids' lives. I'm the first one to violate that. And it's all out of a good place in our hearts. But what we will do sometimes is step over the boundaries of what we actually can do. And we will try to control every waking moment or every part of our children's lives. And what we do is we try to play God in the name of being good parents. We try to do this in our other relationships. We try to do this when it comes to our way, our life, our calling, what we're called to do. Because see, many times I believe, as you know here, that God puts calling inside of human beings. But many times we may not like the calling that God puts inside of us. So what we do is say, God, I don't want that calling. I'm not going to make my own pathway. What we do is now we try to become God. And listen, this has happened since the beginning of time. You've been here long enough to understand Genesis 3. That's when the world went sideways. But when human beings forget their way in the order, things get sideways. When human beings begin to realize and think that your money, especially, let me say this to those I'm speaking to a Jesus Father's room, where you begin to think that your money is your own. You don't begin to read the Bible that everything, the earth is the Lord and all that is in it. And then you wonder why at times there's chaos within the context of your finances because at the end of the day, you now have become God over your finances and not him. You become God over your calling and not him. You become God over your body and not him. You become God over what comes out of your mouth and not him. You become God over what thinks through your mind and not him. You become God, and when when you become God, chaos ensues. And you're wondering why at times you have such turmoil in your life. It's because you will not allow the Prince of Peace, you will not allow the gospel to actually pierce you. Just like my father had to take that needle and pierce me to get rid of infection, what God wants to do with his word and with his gospel is to pierce your soul because in the piercing, peace comes. In the piercing, peace comes. I want you to hear this. There is no peace without pain. There's no peace without pain. And we're going to read the story we're going to pull up today of Jesus and this man by the name of Simeon. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, and he was a righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That that day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to uh, to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms, praising God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. 
Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. This is the reading of God's word. Later on in that passage, something interesting happens from Simeon. Simeon starts talking to Mary. And here's what he says to Mary. That your soul will be pierced. Now, what's interesting about this, let's go, let's go Simeon and we'll get to Mary. What's interesting about Simeon is that Simeon kind of lived as a misfit this whole story. Like, I want you to imagine, like, God spoke to Simeon years before that you're going to see this salvation, this coming, this Christ, this Messiah, who for years people had talked that they had hoped for, they had longed for in the history of Israel for this coming Messiah who would rescue them, who would redeem them, who would set them back into power. That's what they thought in their mind. But who would be this one to come and lead Israel? And so Simeon gets this word in his heart. And I don't know if you've ever had that, where God speaks something to you, and he only spoke it to you. At times, people around you may think you're crazy. To where you get something, and he had something. Can you imagine his friends, like, and Simeon just talking about it? Because he got, man, I'm going to see the coming Messiah. Yeah, 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 everybody else has said that too. Yeah, what makes you a little bit different, homeboy? Because it was a said, Simeon's just a righteous and devout man. It wasn't like Simeon was some perfect man, but God spoke to him. And so Simeon just carried this in his heart over and over and over again. For years and years and years, Simeon carried in his heart that he was going to see this Messiah. And finally it happens. The Spirit leads him, and Simeon shows up, and he's in the temple. Can you imagine? For years, God had promised you something, and he shows up, and then you get to see him, and Simeon didn't care. Simeon grabbed baby Jesus. <laughs> like, listen, like we got some parents in here with some young kids. Ain't there nobody going to be grabbing my baby like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Simeon just went over there and grabbed baby Jesus. And can you imagine if you're marrying Joseph, what God promised you? I got the Savior of the world. Now some man grabbing the Savior of the world. <laughs> Simeon didn't care. Picks up this baby and begins to say what he's going to be and what he's going to bring and what he's come to do. But then Simeon, he gives baby Jesus back. He begins to look at Mary. Now here's the crazy thing about Mary. When you read the Bible about Mary... You don't hear nothing bad about her. Like, there's nothing, again, like Mary, yeah, she was born, so she had a sin nature. But like everybody else, they dirt was out there in the street for the most part. <laughs> like everybody else in the Bible. I mean, there was some, like Simeon, you don't hear, but like somebody who's a main figure in the Bible, they ain't got a ton of, like, you know, they got their dirt out to Peter out there. Like Rahab, the whole Bible, the <laughs> prostitute. Like, I mean, like, no, I like, see change. I'm like, but everybody's dirt's out there. Now, But here's what he said. He says that even your soul is going to be pierced. Even your soul is going to be pierced. See, if the mother of Jesus' soul was pierced, how much more is our soul going to be pierced? See, you have to be pierced in order to find peace. And there's three ways that we're going to respond to this gospel. You're either three people. You're the alligator, you're the samurai, or you're the patient. Now, first, let's start with the alligator, right? We live here in Florida, okay? So we're familiar with these. I didn't grow up here. When I first came here and I heard, hey, check your pool before you ever jump into it, I was like, yo, this is a wild place. You know what I'm saying? This is a wild place. I'm like, the alligator just just jumped in the pool. Again, I have a pool. I have a thing around it. I still... Every time, and we got strong nets around this thing, but every time I'm looking in that pool. One night recently, I jumped in the pool at night, forgot to look in. I went underwater, darn near had a heart attack, because I'm like, it could be an alligator at the bottom. And it was cold outside, too. So, you know, they sit at the bottom, and they come, that's what I heard, all right? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Watch your wild crats with my kids, I heard alligators are, all right? <laughs> and so anyway, so <laughs> what I do, but, but the point is this, though, but when they, when they talk about alligators, what happens with alligators? They got super tough skin. They got really, really tough skin. See, when something comes to pierce you, many of us are like the alligator, where it can't pierce to your skin. We push back. We're like me on the front time when my dad tried to get me to try to pierce where I had this infection in my hand. I pushed back. Why? It's because, again, I didn't want the pain of it. I was scared of it. Many of us at times, we never allow the gospel to penetrate us. It's because we have this thick skin. There's this pride that is there that we will not let it go. 
And see, so here's what happens. So chaos ensues. And here's when many times it comes. It doesn't come from a place where a lot of times that we're in our heads, we're like, you know what? I'm just going to be arrogant and prideful and I'm going to reject God. Most people don't think that. But what happens is that because of the pain that is going on, that's why, again, we put this outer skin. Just like when I had that infection in my hand, there was this tough skin was on the outside of it. See, for us, we have real pain. And what we will do with this real pain is we'll begin to put these shells up that never allows the gospel to penetrate us. Why? It's because, again, it becomes our defense mechanism. So at times, here's what happens. Our arrogance comes off because it, it, deep inside, we have so much pain here that we don't want anything to touch it anymore. Because here's why. Because at one point in time when you were in a vulnerable place, somebody or something, somebody lied, someone violated you, whatever it was, we put this shell up now on us to where now we cannot be pierced at all. And what we say is this, and we don't say it verbally, guys, but deep inside our hearts. I'm in control of my life now. No one else will be. I can, I'm going to protect myself because if God did, if God was real, then why did he protect me here? We don't say that, but that's how we live. We live in the fact that when we have deepest places of pain, it's where God actually wants to go with his gospel, where it's causing you so much chaos. It's causing you chaos in your relationships right now. Because at the end of the day, there's so much turmoil that's happened from your past. There's so many things that you have not forgiven someone or that you have not forgiven yourself. And the gospel of Jesus wants to come in where he talks about the idea of his forgiveness toward you, but also our forgiveness toward someone else. It's creating chaos in your life. It's an infectious disease that you don't know you have. So why you can't stay in relationship? Why at times your relationships are dysfunctional? Why at times you can't interact with your husband or you're struggling at times with your children or whatever it is, it's because you will not let the gospel deal with the infection in your soul. And we just live this way. And here's what we do. We blame everyone else, but deep inside, Jesus is saying, let my gospel penetrate your heart. I understand what they did to you, but I need you to release forgiveness. But I also am giving you forgiveness. I'm just releasing this. I know that you didn't do anything to cause this, but his gospel of expiation, that he makes you as white as snow, even the sin that came against you. Why I believe this Bible, why I love this cross. As Abraham Kuyper once said, the cross is a multifaceted jewel. When you look at it from every angle, there's just something different and beautiful about it. And the gospel of expiation says this, someone sinned against you. But on the cross, when Jesus died, the sin that you committed and the sin committed against you died with him. And why does that matter? It's because God, listen, you want good relationships. You want them to happen but you won't let the gospel get there. You won't allow it to begin to heal you. You won't allow it to begin to touch those places. You keep being frustrated. You keep going from place to place, relationship advice to relationship advice, instead of allowing the gospel to go there. Because see, when you really begin to let it pierce you, forgiveness begins to come. Some of us, we have this thick skin because of society and the world that we live in. Here's the beauty of America. I love this place. But here's the beauty. Here's the, I'm saying here's the tough part of it. The whole experiment of America was freedom. And what we bound to think freedom is, is freedom to do whatever we want that I can make my own way. And there are beautiful parts of being able to go and carve. I know there's other nations and places where people, when they grow up, they don't even have an opportunity. We do. But here's what makes this dangerous is when we realize in this country, sometimes we don't have limits. We think we live without limits. And so for some of us in this room, God is, you've been wanting to know, what does God have for me? What does he have for me? But what he's wanting to do is to pierce the inside, the, the person in you because he's wanting that old person to die to liberate actually who you are. God, what do you have for me? And he wants to tell you, but here's the thing about God. He's never going to, he, you're going to have to be willing to invite him in. See, I want you to think about that. We spend a lot of our lives wrestling over and over and over and over again with why am I here? And what he wants to do is to begin to pierce to liberate that. 
See, we are in a time right now where on the outside world, everyone's saying this. They're like, man, I do what I want. There's nothing on the outside that determines, there's nothing on the outside that can define me. Nothing on the outside can define me. My parents can't define me. Christianity can't define me. Government can't, no, nothing can define me. So now what you're left with is you trying to define yourself, and that never goes well. It never goes well. Human beings, we actually think we're way better than what we are. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Where is in your life that the gospel of Jesus tries to actually pierce you? I'm going to tell you mine. All right? So we're going to have a healthy therapy session, all right? So you listen to me. There we go. Here we go. Come back. Here we go. Here's mine. Being a Jesus follower, really trying to live according to the gospel, leading a church, doing all this stuff, there's so many times in my life I do not want to extend forgiveness. Because what I can easily do is form this outer scar of self-righteousness because I've legit got real pains. And I can justify those real pains now and say, you know what? Now, I, I won't say it out loud. I have enough Jesus in me, right, to cover it up. I got enough, I got enough, listen, I got enough, I'm going to say this, I got enough like social awareness and common sense to cover it. Some of y'all don't have that. But here's what I, but here's the thing. But deep inside, I don't, God, I've been a good soldier for you. No, nah, my forgiveness has run out. And here's what the Lord constantly keeps reminding me. If you don't allow this to continue to pierce your soul, you'll never walk on this side of eternity to the fullness of what I've called you to because it's going to corrupt you. Listen, that's why Jesus says count the cost. It's really hard because you know why? When he says take up your cross daily, we read that, we quote that, we put it up on a little monogram thing that you get at Hobby Lobby, and it's so cute. It's, it's amazing. Until you really understand that. He literally says, take up your cross. You know what he says? He literally says, put yourself, let the gospel pierce you every day. And I'm like, dog, this hurts. So what is it for you? What's in your life right now that the gospel is not piercing? To where now you've become God, you've gone outside your limits. We all have it. What is it? Here's the next thing is this, is that, and again, I gotta try to land this plane soon, but the idea is this, is that the next thing is that you become the samurai. So again, if you know anything about samurais, again, you watch The Last Samurai, you know, Tom Cruise, all right? Um, sorry, bad joke, but anyway. <laughs> but The Last Samurai, but if you watch it, anything about samurai, what would happen? The samurai wanted to die on its sword. They didn't want someone to but they wanted to die on its sword. See, what some of us do when the gospel comes, we die on our sword. And it looks very humble. It looks like humility. You're right. God, I'm the worst. I have no forgiveness. You're right. God, you know what? Everybody else is better than me. I suck. I got to change. You're right. And we go to this place of self-loathing like we run ourselves through. But deep inside, behind the self-loathing is idolatry of self still. Like some of you in this room, you play the victim way too much. And it looks self-righteous. Wow. It looks righteous. Like, oh, you're, no, it's not. At the end of the day, it's idolatry. You are still at the end of that. See, when the gospel pierces you, it's not to kill you. It's to make you better. And some of you let the gospel run you all the way through because you don't see the good side of it. And what I mean by this, yes, there is conviction. There are things that come. There's time, listen, conviction is a gift from God. But on the other side, why conviction is beautiful is because there's a loving, kind, merciful God. Some of you cannot get past what God has for you because you're still a victim. And you're no longer a victim. You have volunteered yourself there. Wow. You're just a volunteer there. You have now built real estate in this land of being a victim. You've got great beachfront property. 
And here's what you'll do. And here's the, and the other day is here's the dangerous by being a samurai. You'll spend the rest of your life thinking you're a martyr. Wow. And you're not. You're an idolater. And no people are going to tell you that. Especially in our world that we live in now. Because why? It's because you can never say anything to anyone that, again, this is just what I feel, this is where I'm at. And I don't, listen, I don't say this in jest. I don't say this just as like to be super, trying to be funny or cute, but I want you to understand this because I, like, I just have watched this for years. I've watched people for years just go and go and go and live as a victim, live as a victim, blame everyone else, blame everyone else, and don't realize that there's actually freedom. That there's actually freedom in the gospel. Because here's the truth about it. Paul had all the rights he wanted to to blame everyone else for the persecution that happened to him. But yet and still he said, I still rejoice in this. He had something different. Why? It's because he allowed the gospel to pierce him, even things that were unjust to him. And it wasn't like he didn't have to wrestle with the emotionality of it. But at the end of the day, there was something far greater. There is something far greater than the abuse that happened to you. There's something far greater than how your parents treated you. There's something far greater than that boss who let you go. There's something far greater than that person who betrayed you or that person that they would never leave you. There's something far greater. And I believe this by the spirit of God. God is saying for some of you, get off of your mat. There is a healing God who wants to do a miraculous work in your life. But you got to answer this question. Do you want to be made well? And that is the good news of Jesus. See, the gospel pierces the arrogant and the gospel pierces the victim. See, here's the last and final thing is this. Or will you be the patient? So, something interesting happened. As I mentioned earlier with my father, he asked me this question. Adrian, do you trust me? I'm like, dog. I got, I mean, just one of those moments, right? As a kid, you're like, I can't tell my dad I don't trust him. But like, I actually did trust my dad. I just did not trust his ability to be a friend, like, you know, like, like on the field surgeon, like I didn't trust that. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, so crying, yeah, daddy, yeah, 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 I trust you. And then he was saying to me, he's like, you know, he's like, I'm not trying to hurt you. I need to help you. But here's what I appreciate about my father. He gave me a choice. So either way, you don't have to do this. But it's like, who are you going to trust? Now, looking back on I'm like, yeah, I probably should have went to the hospital to trust them. But all right, you know. But here's the point. What I didn't know is this. is how much he actually loved me. Like, I didn't know that. See, what happens when the gospel, when I talk about being, you're going to either be the alligator, the samurai, or the patient. The patient willingly goes on the operating table and the surgeon pierces you just enough to make you better. See, some of you have been coming here for a long time, but yet and still you have not surrendered to Jesus. You've not put yourself on the operating table because whenever he begins to touch a part of your life that you don't like, you hop off the table and run away. But actually those who live and walk this thing out are willing to lay on the table and allow the gospel of Jesus to pierce you. And he's not piercing you to hurt you. He's piercing you to bring peace to you. Some of you need to stop having the pride and you need to get with someone because your marriage is in shambles. But your pride won't allow you to humble yourself And actually, the freedom, the peace that you're wanting in your marriage will come when you humble yourself. Some of you, you've been in sin patterns, and God wants to begin to walk you through that process of seeing you get free, but you have to humble yourself. Some of you, there's so much unforgiveness in your heart, but you have to humble yourself.
where you lay on the operating table and where you allow Jesus to do the work that he needs to do. In the book of Jeremiah, there's a story where God tells Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. And as Jeremiah goes to the potter's house, he sees this potter making this, he's making, he's going, he's molding, he's shaping. But see, this thing was marred in its hand as he's making and shaping it. And what God speaks to Jeremiah is saying, this is how I am, this is how Israel is into my hands. See, God wants to mold and shape us as a church body, but he makes us as a church body as he molds and shapes you as individuals, as he molds and shapes all of us. But you got to be willing to let him do it. See, as we talk about Jesus and Christmas and peace and all of this, Isaiah 53, 5 says it this way. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. It says peace. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Isaiah, in other translations, it says that so that we could have peace. Jesus had to be pierced because that brings us peace. Because our first parents brought sin into the world. They did what? They stepped outside of their limits. They stepped outside of the order of being and said, we want to be God. And so what happened? Sin entered the world. And so the only way that because there was, a, there was justice that had to be served, somebody had to come underneath the sword to be pierced. There's a story in, you know, we read Genesis 3 a lot, but I haven't read this part to you guys. I've said it at times where there's a flaming sword. When they get kicked out of the garden, there's this flaming sword going back and forth. And it's really weird. You're like, it's kind of like a Lord of the Rings type of thing, right? Where there's a sword just going back and forth. And here's what it was. It was a sign to say anybody to get back into the presence has to go underneath the sword. That is why Jesus is pierced for our transgressions to do what? To bring us peace and to bring us wholeness. So here's where we're at right now. Are you the alligator, the samurai, or are you the patient? Are you the alligator, are you the samurai, or are you the patient? And I want to tell you this, for the rest of your life, for some of you right now, this may be the first time you respond to Jesus. I want to let everybody else know, for the rest of your life, if you serve Jesus, whatever you come to a moment with him, either you're going to be the alligator, the samurai, or the patient. And what Jesus calls us to do by his power is to be the patient. And here's why we can be that. Like I said, I trusted the love of my father. We can trust the love of him that he's actually really good. He's actually really good. Most of us don't trust him because we only see the judgment side of him. But here's the thing. He can fully be just and fully be loving. We can't do that. He can. And so I want you to know he's incredibly good. You don't put yourself on the operating table of a surgeon who's got like one, got a one-star review, right? Like if the Yelp review is like, nah, dog, don't do that. My, my surgery is a little bit off. You're not going there, right? You, go to, you try to find the best because why? You can trust him. And so that's my encouragement today. Will you trust him? Father, we thank you so much for today. While we're here, in this attitude of prayer, God's been speaking something. And you know you've been the, maybe you've been the alligator. Maybe pride has been the way. Maybe you've been the samurai self-loathing. But you know you need to respond to him right now. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hand just because I want to pray with you today. God bless you and God bless you. Is there anybody else that wants to be prayed for today? And God bless you. That you're saying, listen, I, my soul needs to be pierced. See, if you're responding, this is what I want you to do. Because, see, this is between you and God. Begin to confess where you have missed it. And be specific with him. This is between you and God. Right now, just begin to say, God, I am sorry because of this. I repent of because of this. Father, I thank you for those who are responding. And God, what I pray for is that the mercy and grace would begin to overflow in their lives, God. Father, I pray that they would feel your goodness. They would feel your kindness and your love. I pray for a greater measurement of your Holy Spirit right now to fill them, God. 
And God, it would allow them to lay on the operating table, God. Let them begin to see your goodness, God. Let them begin to see that you are kind, God. That you are God who not trying to pierce them because you're trying to hurt them, but you're trying to heal them, God. And so, Father, we are asking right now for you to do something that only you can do, Father. Father, let us be a church. Let us be a people who really do walk in wholeness and peace. Let us be a church that walks in peace so that we can bring peace to the worlds that we go to. We love you and we honor you. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. If you don't mind standing to your feet, we are going to go now into a